Thank you again to everybody for joining. So I'll go ahead and introduce our um, panelists for tonight um, and then have everybody say a few words about themselves. Um, joined with uh, Christy McGillivray, the uh, political and legislative director for Sierra Club uh, here in Michigan, as well as um, James Cliff, the deputy director of uh, the Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy, uh, who also worked with us at Clean Water during his long uh, ten years, the policy director for Michigan Environmental Council before this. Um, and uh, we're also joined by um, Peter Manning, uh, Deputy Attorney General, who is the Division Chief um, of the Environment, Natural Resources, and Agriculture Division. Uh, and then we also have um, joining us floor leader Yusuf Rabi, um, Democratic State House Representative uh, from Michigan's 53rd District. Um, and we were also going to be having Senator Jeff Irwin join. Um, he may join if he's able, but with Senate session running late, uh, he's in Lansing representing his constituents tonight. Um, and big thank you uh, to Representative Robbie for joining us, especially after such a hectic day um, in the Michigan State Legislature. And um, you know, today, for those of you who may not have seen, there was a lot of um, protests in the state legislature around uh, the governor's stay home, stay safe executive order, uh, which is really out there to protect public health. And the fact that, um, you know, these protests moved forward in the way they did is really a display of the fact that currently leadership in the state house and state senate and the majority side of the aisle um, is not really taking public health protection seriously and is not taking the leadership role that we need them to take on public health. And, you know, as it happens, tonight's topic relates directly to that. Uh, they've also not taken the leadership role that they've had an opportunity to take with um, making sure that we're holding polluting corporations in Michigan accountable um, who uh, you know, are actively harming public health and communities across our state. Um, so with that, I'll hand it over to our panelists to introduce themselves. If um, Christy, would you like to start? Sure, thanks, Sean. Um, and I'll keep it brief because I'm sure we want to all hear from everyone else. Um, this issue is really important to Sierra Club, uh, first and foremost, because we have members and the general public contact us all the time um, with concerns about, uh, you know, abandoned uh, toxic waste sites, concerns about their groundwater. Um, and when it comes to actually trying to help give them answers, um, we have to usually start with the premise that our laws are really structured to protect polluters and not the public. Um, the burden of proof is on our own bodies. We have to prove that we're sick um, instead of requiring polluters to prove that either what they're putting on the market is safe or that they've adequately cleaned it up. And so we are just so grateful for the leadership of folks like Representative Robbie and Senator Jeff, Jeff Irwin um, because we have to take these steps towards fixing our broken regulatory system. Great. Thank you so much, Christy. And uh, Senator Irwin has been able to uh, join us. So thank you so much for joining, Senator. We're just doing some brief introductions. So I guess I'll pass it off to you since you're not voting right now. <laughs> you're up, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you can hear me now. Can you hear me? We can hear yeah. you. All right. Well, I am um, currently on the floor of the Senate, obviously. Sorry to um, have our calendar be bent such that I couldn't participate better in this. Um, and I'm going to have to step away to uh, offer another speech. Uh, for those of you who don't know what's happening here in the legislature today, the um, Republicans have proposed rejecting the governor's emergency declaration, which um, puts a lot of people at risk of uh, you know, losing unemployment if, say, for instance, their employer wants to open back up, but they're not providing the proper protection equipment. Uh, so I know you're here to talk about clean water. Uh, I'm going to try to jump on uh, again, sir, as soon as we're done. Uh, but I appreciate uh, Yusuf kind of holding up my end tonight. He's been a great partner on fighting for clean water uh, here in Lansing. And... Um, you know, our bills to create a reinvigorated polluter pay policy are so important because, okay, thank you, sorry, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking next. So, um, 
Well, these bills are so important because they're they're critical to protecting our water quality and holding polluters accountable. We've got folks right now who who aren't well inspected, who are polluting our water, and um, you know we need to be able to have the tools to require them to clean it up. It's as simple as that. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Irwin, and um, that I'll pass it off to uh, Floor Leader Yusuf Rabi um, to talk about uh, to introduce himself. Yeah, thank you, Sean. And, uh, you know, thank you to Senator Irwin, uh, you know, who, who is still out there, you know, fighting the good fight. We had uh, quite an interesting day today as uh, Sean and Jeff were both, uh, well, Jeff's right in the thick of it still. So uh, my name is Yusuf Rappi. I'm the state representative for the 53rd district. I'm serving in my second term right now. Uh, and I serve as the Democratic floor leader in the Michigan State House. Um, I was proud to introduce uh, the polluter pay bill uh, in 2019 after uh, that was a reintroduction, actually, because I actually had introduced it uh, prior to that in 2017 as well um, in my first term. And so at the beginning of my second term in 2019, I, I reintroduced it along with Senator Irwin, who has been a great partner on this. Um, and uh, so he has the Senate bill. I have the House bill. Um, and, you know, we are we are continuing to fight for it. It's one of those issues that is uh, incredibly easy for people to understand. And I think that, um, you know, especially as we you know are in the middle of this. Uh, you know, current crisis that we're in, I think it underscores uh, the importance of highlighting how pollution impacts public health. Because, uh, you know, when you see higher rates uh, of death and uh, with, with folks that are contracting COVID, with folks that have uh, asthma um, and other pre-existing conditions that are often caused by air pollution, water pollution, all the things that we're trying to fight against, it really uh, buttresses the argument that we need to be taking on pollution in the state of Michigan um, and polluter pay is one way to do that. Not only does it on, on the back end, once the pollution is made, uh, force the polluters to clean it up, but it also creates uh, this incredible disincentive for pollution to occur in the first place. Uh, hopefully keeping, um, you know, again, a lot of our, uh, our, our environment. Awesome, thank you very much. Uh, oh, but yeah. we. Thank you very I much. Cut, I cut out there briefly, but I was just saying, keeping our environment clean. So thanks for having me on the panel. Yes, thank you very much, Representative. And um, so next we'll introduce uh, Deputy Attorney General Peter Manning uh, to introduce himself. Thanks, Sean. Um, I'm glad to be here. So um, I am the Division Chief of the Environment, Natural Resources and Agriculture Division, which represents EGLE, uh, DNR, and the Department of Agriculture and Rural Development. Um, so I've been with the office for 20, well, 26 years now. Um, and one of the things that I'll talk about maybe a little bit later, I guess I can talk about it now. What's interesting is that when I was hired into the office in 1994, it was fairly shortly after the Michigan Environmental Response Act um, was passed, which imposed strict liability, um, had pretty rigorous cleanup standards. and. I was actually hired because we were doing an initiative in the office um, to go out and hold some of the, the polluters responsible. Um, so that's sort of, that's my relevant background. I am also um, the emergency management coordinator for the department. So I'm a little tired myself. We've been uh, working hard for the last month on uh, some of these executive orders. Um, but with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to, to James, I guess. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, my, I'm James Clift. I'm uh, one of the deputy directors at the Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy. I've uh, been there for a little over a year. Um, and as Sean mentioned, uh, prior to that, I've been with the Michigan Environmental Council for the past 20 years. Um, I guess first, just want to touch on the fact that we are still out there doing our jobs. You know, ever since kind of the executive order and even before that went in place, uh, we've been uh, basically telecommuting from home uh, about, uh, it started to be very quickly, we ramped up to 90% of our employees kind of working from home. We're currently up around 95%. So we've been still out there doing the job of protecting public health and natural resources. Um, been a lot of discussion about uh, the EPA came out with some guidance and they actually suspended some regulation reporting requirements um, but it was voluntary and it allowed each of the states to kind of basically kind of create a program that, that they thought fit that state. 
So in Michigan, what we did and a number of other states did this is that we basically didn't suspend anything. But if a company thought because of COVID that they couldn't comply, they come to us and they request permission to either delay kind of doing a test or, or basically they have to explain kind of what, what the provision of their permit or, or license was that they don't think they can comply with, um, how they think or when they think they will be able to comply with. And then basically we kind of either grant or deny that request. Um, we are trying to be totally transparent with that. So if you go to the Eagle website, right at the very top, there's a, there's a thing that talks about COVID and enforcement discretion. And every week what we do is we've got a spreadsheet of every single company that's asked for that discretion and basically our response to it. Um, and then basically at the end of each week, we kind of put in the, the last week's information in there. So we keep updating it on a weekly basis. So you can kind of see the types of things and most of them are fairly uh, straightforward. You got a lot of people out there that have like licenses and certifications that they can't renew because the classes aren't being offered or the, the test isn't being offered. So we're basically allowing people certification labs, knowing that they'll be certified in the next month or two once those classes and, and tests are offered again. A lot of cases it's a, they might be doing quarterly testing on their facility somehow and we're allowing them to delay that for maybe a month, you know. In those cases where we've seen violations in the past, we've been pretty strict on making sure that basically people are in compliance um, and making sure that public health is protected. Um, we do respond to complaints that are made to the department. We still go out in the field, you know, with proper gear um, and make sure that people are in compliance with their permit. So. I guess I'll, I'll stop there. Looking forward to participating in the panel and talking about the, the, the cleanup programs in Michigan. Yeah, thank you very much, um, James, for that overview. And it's definitely, um, you know, I, I, I know at least uh, myself personally, I was very glad to see when uh, the EPA said they were backing off on enforcement, Eagle kind of said they were stepping up enforcement to make sure that that's still continuing. Um, so thanks for all of uh, the excellent work there. Um, so the uh, first thing that we have uh, on our agenda this evening is uh, for a quick overview um, from Deputy Director Cliff about how our current Part 201 program works, which is um, Michigan's Environmental Cleanup Program, how it's funded, um, any insights you might have from when we did have a polluter pay law, um, and um, I'll also hand it back to you. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, and, you know, making this simple is, is the big challenge here. So I'm going to do my best here. You know, the bottom line in our program, it starts with basically identification of a facility. And a facility is what we call kind of any site where hazardous substances have been released, you know, at levels that we think pose a danger to the public. Um, so a lot of times the facility itself sometimes comes to us. You know, and if they've known what they call a reportable quantity has been released, they're required to come to us and, and tell us that they have a facility. Um, sometimes it might be something where the release occurred and maybe it's gotten into the groundwater and they now realize that groundwater is basically migrating off their property. Um, in that case, they've got to come and tell us that they have a facility. Um, but there are some cases where, where if, the, if they don't have a reportable quantity and it hasn't left their the property boundaries, then they don't have to tell the state and they are allowed to proceed with a cleanup pursuant to the law, um, but what's called a self-implemented cleanup. And that was one of the changes that was made basically um, in 1995 um, and even later amendments that, that, that came after that. Um, but when you get into this question of polluter pay, the original law and the federal law was based on a concept called strict liability. You know, any owner or operator of a property was basically responsible for the cleanup of that property. Um, that was changed in 1995 in Michigan um, to basically you're only responsible if you were responsible for the activity that caused the release. And that kind of raised the burden on the state, you know, kind of a heightened that, that evidence that had to be gathered to kind of demonstrate that, you know, a person was the responsible party. You know, sometimes this is a pretty easy case. 
Same company has owned the site for 50 years. They've been operating the whole time. That's pretty straightforward who's the responsible party um, in that case. But if you've got a facility that's changed hands a number of times, they've been running the same type of operation, sometimes trying to figure out exactly which of the operators was responsible for the release, you know, can be a little tricky. Um, and that kind of gets into that, that liability, you know, the question there. Now, an important part is, is that if we have an owner today that's not the person who caused the release, they do have responsibilities to protect the public. Now, these are called due care responsibilities, and it's to make sure that the public isn't being exposed to an unacceptable um, level of hazardous substances there. So there are basically responsibilities. They just may not be responsible to do the entire cleanup, you know, at the site. Funding for the program over the years has changed. At the very beginning, it was a lot of what they call general fund, you know, just regular taxpayer dollars were going to kind of support the program and the staff that, that, that operated this program. And, and for the first number of years, that, that was the primary funding source. Um, over the years, the, the voters of the state of Michigan have uh, passed various environmental bonds um, sometimes those bonds were dedicated to the cleanup of environmental sites. So starting in 1988 and again in 1998, voters passed bond that, that allocated money to clean up. So that money was used to basically fund the program in large part. Um, those bond sources have now been exhausted at this point. So currently the program is funded with a combination of um, you know, any money you get back from a responsible party. So sometimes, you know, the, the department spends money investigating a site. They refer it over to P Peter and his folks over there. They go through a prosecution and we get some money back through that. Th those funds are then rededicated toward pursuing other sites um, in some cases. Um, some of the, of the unclaimed bottle deposit money has actually been the largest source of, you know, kind of money coming into the program right now. Um, and uh, so that money where people don't come back for their dimes, a certain portion of that comes to the department and a certain portion of that is dedicated toward the, the cleanup program. Um, then the last part is that we have got kind of two main types of sites in Michigan. Part 201 is the main kind of general cleanup program and part 213 is where the underground storage tank sites are. Um, and Michigan unfortunately has a number of old gas stations where underground storage tanks were improperly um, left in the ground, leaked over the years. Um, so that program has its own funding source. Um, there's actually what's called the Refined Petroleum Fund from a small surcharge on the sale of gasoline. Um, and that helps run that department to do the cleanups of some of the underground storage tank sites. Um, it seems like I'm missing one source of money here, but I'm sure it will come to me. Um, oh, Renew Mo New Michigan is kind of a new source of money that we've been kind of using. Um, it is, a, again, kind of a, a general tax revenue that's come into the department just recently in this past year or so that we've been using for cleanups. Uh, so those have been the primary cleanup standards. Um, I'll just end here just talking a little bit about kind of our how our cleanup program works. And, it, it's what's called kind of a risk-based program. It really kind of goes on the, the concept of, you know, identify the extent of your contamination, try to figure out where the public might be exposed from that contamination, and make sure you're limiting that exposure. Um, so maybe you think about it in a landfill situation, you know, you, can, you cap it, you make sure that none of that is kind of migrating off site. With a groundwater plume sometimes, and unfortunately the residents of the Ann Arbor area are very familiar with Gelman Science and the groundwater plume there, you know, it's a matter of kind of tracking and trying to contain the plume where, where it's been over the years, um, you know, pumped and treated to a certain extent. But, but that's kind of, again, in an effort to try to minimize that exposure uh, to the public. Um, let me stop there. I'm sure uh, Peter will be able to fill in some gaps uh, where places I may have missed. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for that overview, James. That helps. And um, 
Yeah, Deputy AG Manning, if you could, um, you know, please talk a little bit about that and also just what the Department of Attorney General does to hold polluting corporations accountable. Sure. Um, so as I mentioned, when I when I started sort of an interesting um, uh, part of my history is, again, I was hired by Frank Kelly in 1994. Um, the statute at that point, as James mentioned, was called status liability. It was strict liability. Essentially, anybody who owned the property um, could be held liable for the pollution um, on the property. Uh, the statute really put the onus on um, property owners. You know, if you brought in a property owner, um, they would have to go against other responsible parties rather than requiring the state um, to go out and find all of the responsible parties. Um, so in that way, you know, people could argue whether that was good policy or fair. Um, I'm not a policy person. It certainly made my job a lot easier um, when we walked into a room and we had a person who owned the property. Um, they were legally held responsible for that contamination. It made the job um, easier. Um, the other thing that I noticed uh, Representative Robbie and Senator Owens' bill um, would, would try to do a little bit less of the sort of risk-based kind of cleanup. Again, when the statute was originally enacted, um, it was based on criteria. You had to clean up to, to certain levels, residential or industrial. Um, and so, you know, that much less were you allowed to sort of limit exposures and things like that. Again, not a policy person, but that certainly was a, was a black line that, that was easier, um, you know, for us to, for us to target as opposed to a risk-based, um, cleanup. So that's, when I, that's where I started. Um, obviously, the statute has changed. And um, as James mentioned, it is based on whether someone was responsible for an activity that caused a release. So there's more work on the department to try to find these parties, a um, little bit more uh, difficult enforcement issue. So talk about the AG a little bit. Um, you know, the environmental uh, protection is a huge priority for her. Um, when she came in, she had several areas in which she was doing this, but she called it course correction. Um, so one of the things we did, we were um, under the former AG involved in uh, some of the federal lawsuits um, over the Obama administration's uh, Waters of the United States rule, uh, clean power plan, immediately got out of those. She's been very active in the, in the federal space. Um, there are a lot of things going on at the federal level in terms of what they're uh, doing in the environmental area. Um, our office is super involved in that. Um, again, we are going to challenge the WOTUS rule, um, clean power, the Affordable Clean Energy Act. Um, we are part of that challenge. We were involved in the county of um, Maui case, um, whether groundwater is regulated in the Clean Water Act. I noticed that someone had asked a question about that. Um, greenhouse gas emissions, mileage standards, uh, the mercury rule. So um, the AG is super involved in it. She really wants to be aggressive. Um, you know, she wants to do, she wants to do enforcement. So um, obviously some of the bigger things, and again, sorry, this is not per se a polluter pay issue at this point, and we all hope it never becomes one. Line five obviously is a huge issue for the AG. Um, as most people know, we have a lawsuit against Enbridge um, seeking to have the, the line shut down. We're also defending the lawsuit that was filed by Enbridge challenging her opinion um, that was issued early in her term. Um, uh, basically saying that the, the structure that had been set up to build a tunnel in the Straits was not um, lawful. So more on the, the topic of, of polluters pain, obviously, a huge deal to her was PFAS. Um, we are, as I think most people know, have sued 3M, DuPont, and I think 17 other manufacturers of PFAS. Um, pretty unprecedented suit. We're one of the very first states to be out there bringing this kind of an action where we are trying to hold those companies essentially responsible for all of the damage um, that has been done by those products. Um, it, you know, it is a very sort of unique claim. Uh, we do have a part 201 claim in there, which again is the cleanup statute, um, but a lot of tort based um, claims as well really are throwing whatever we can um, at, at those manufacturers. Um, 
Sean also mentioned uh, Wolverine. Um, obviously, that's a PFAS site as well. Um, and that, you know, we think was a, was a pretty good, um, got a pretty good result out of that. Um, you almost never make everybody happy, but uh, Wolverine, just to back up, Wolverine has, you know, had a longstanding um, shoe manufacturing operation, Wolverine shoes, Hush Puppies, and um, PFAS, PFOA, those products were used to waterproof, um, disposed of the, those products um, in really a, a, you know, a landfill that started in the 1950s. So had no, no standards, no liners, um, obviously had contamination around their plant. Um, the end result of that is that, um, that Wolverine is going to pay over $60 million to get about a thousand properties hooked up to municipal water um, to protect them. They're going to have to uh, do remedial activities to uh, control the contamination, continue testing, um, so, you know, we, the tools are there. Um, I think the tools could be, uh, improved, but, um, we have a great relationship with Eagle. Um, they obviously, they refer cases to us and then, um, we, we take those cases, but we work very closely with them. Um, so I'll stop there, but the, um, again, AG is, is, is all on board for doing whatever she can in whatever media to stop pollution. So, um, you know, I think it's a, that's a good thing for everybody. Sean, let me just make one point before I throw it back to you here. And the one thing we haven't mentioned is a concept that maybe some of the attendees have heard is called orphans, orphan sites. And these are sites where the responsible party has either died, you know, is insolvent, you know, bankrupt. Um, and these are states that the sites that then fall back to the state. Um, you know, altogether, we've got, you know, approximately 24,000 sites in Michigan, uh, 15,000 under the Part 201 program, another 8,000 under the, the underground storage tank program. Um, a, a large percentage of those sites, unfortunately, are orphan sites um, where the state basically is the party who is in there trying to protect public health. But it's a good, that's a, one of the main uh, purposes of the bond money over the years has really been to have some money to address those sites, especially those ones that uh, create public health risk to, to communities across the state. Wow. <clears throat> yeah, thank you very much uh, for including that, James. That was actually going to be one of the first um, questions I was going to ask was really by the numbers here, 24,000 um, contaminated sites, I know, for a lot of folks, it's hard to sort of wrap our minds around uh, that many contaminated sites across Michigan. Um, but um, so moving into our Q&A section here, um, you know, one thing I think that's pressing and has been on people's minds, um, so, well, and, you know, to, so to back up to that um, 24,000, and so James, um, I know you don't have uh, this exact number offhand probably, but about how many of those are active cleanup sites versus sites that are just being tracked? That's a good, that's a good question. I don't have a really good number. I mean, at any one time, I think, you know, we're working on, I would say hundreds of sites maybe at various stages along the process. Um, and um, it, it, that might be under, it, under county, we can get kind of some of that information, you know, back to you. But, you know, active sites where a responsible party doing cleanups, you know, we're reviewing documents, um, you know, it's, it's hundreds across the state. Again, a lot of these sites, you know, and some of them at this point, they're, they're very old sites, they're in databases, but like on an old underground storage tank site, it might be posing no risk whatsoever to public health. But you know, we haven't got, you know, we haven't had the resources to get back there and check it out. So, you know, we don't actually know. Um, we've done some programs in the past where we've triaged and went back to old sites, uh, the underground storage tank uh, program, and not in any scientific way, got back to about a thousand sites over uh, a couple of years ago. About 10% of those needed kind of immediate work done on them. About 40% needed more work, you know, didn't have to be it immediately. And about half of them really didn't need to have any more work. So again, there's all types of sites out there, you know, a lot of effort going on. And really, 
especially when it comes to the orphan sites, we're focusing all of our energy on those ones that we think pose the greatest risk to public health. Yeah, thank you very much. And um, so, and I'll throw this uh, question out just sort of for, I'd love to get um, multiple people's takes on this. One of the things that's been, I know, top of mind um, for, a, for a lot of people with the COVID-19 uh, global pandemic going right now, um, we know that COVID-19 is going to have um, major effects on the state budget um, moving forward. We won't know exactly what that effect will be for quite some time. Um, but how might uh, this pandemic affect the state budget and the funding uh, that we currently have, which we know is not enough um, to cover environmental cleanups? And um, following up off of that, does anybody think that this situation might make um, a more robust polluter pay law like that introduced by Representative Robbie and Senator Irwin um, more necessary right now? I, I don't know if you yeah. set that one up for me, but I can try to answer it. <laughs> yeah, please. That's good. <laughs> uh, my cat joined me earlier. Her name's Lala, for those that are watching. She, she's now sitting over there watching me, making sure I don't say anything wrong. Um, and uh, just a minute ago, a neighbor of mine uh, dropped off some, uh, some coffee uh, on my front porch, so that's why I was waving. Um, so, you know... I think there's a few things to discuss when it comes to the state budget. <clears throat> um, first of all, I think there's going to be a massive impact to the state budget generally because people aren't buying as much anymore, right? This uh, state budget relies heavily on sales tax. The other piece of it, of course, is income tax, um, you know, and with folks not being able to work uh, and make an income, obviously those, those tax revenues, uh, you know, are being cut off. But one of, the, one of the things that was mentioned uh, earlier, which is sort of an interesting thing that kind of remains to be seen, James, I think, was mentioning this, uh, is one of, one, of the sources, one of the sources of um, income for cleanup is the unreturned uh, bottle deposit. And right now we don't have, uh, you know, stores aren't taking bottles back, uh, which I, I wonder, I just posed the question, I don't know how that is actually going to impact that fund. I wonder if... Um, you know, people are going to re uh, return all of their cans in bulk, uh, you know, at the end of this. I, I don't know quite how that's going to end up looking, but that could, you know, how that ends up turning out could have an impact on funding for, um, you know, for, for environmental cleanup. And the thing that I do want to say about that piece, too, is before this pandemic, uh, you know, uh, shut the state down, one of the things that we were discussing as a legislature was a series of amendments to the uh, bottle deposit laws, which would have divvied up some of that money and actually taken it away from uh, the cleanup, uh, going to cleanups um, and giving it to actually some of the uh, distributors of soft drinks and beer, uh, you know, throughout the state. Um, so that would have actually had a significant impact reducing um, the revenue that comes in that supports pollution cleanup uh, you know, one of the consequences of, or one of the impacts, positive impact, I guess, of the shutdown is that discussion, right as we were about to vote on it, literally that week, it was about to be scheduled the next week. And, um, you know, things shut down, and we weren't able to have session that day. Um, and we haven't brought up the bills since then. So that is, uh, you know, that would have been a, a huge negative, a huge impact um, on, you know, the, the cleanup that James is talking about cleanup funds that James is talking about. Um, and that that's off, uh, off the table for now, though it could come back um, this, as soon as we get, you know, start coming back into session, which could happen as early as next week. But I don't know how, whether we'll get into the flow of um, non-COVID related legislation um, like those bills um, remains to be seen still. But overall, generally the response to your question is it's still uncertain what's gonna happen, but there is gonna be a massive impact uh, just because revenues are going to go down. We're already seeing furloughs, um, you know, across the state, and those could impact, you know, cleanups as well. So th there's just a lot of moving parts here and a lot of things we've got to look out for. Um, and there will, be, there will be undoubtedly impacts, and that means that we all have to step up. Uh, I've served on the County Board of Commissioners, uh, you know, starting in 2011. There was still a time that we had that cuts were being made to, to local budgets, 
um, we're going to start seeing that again. And I can tell you, you know, being uh, in, in on the commission at the time, we, you know, we really need to fight for the resources that we believe should be going to the things that we care about. If we believe in environmental cleanup, if we believe in clean air and clean water, you know, this is, this is the time when we really need to step up. I mean, we've always needed to step up, but now we really need to step up with scarce resources to make sure that we get that funding, protect, protect the funding that is going to uh, environmental cleanup and even advocate for uh, more. Because as I was saying earlier, now it has never been, uh, you know, more clear uh, when you look at the environmental justice aspect of things, when you look at the neighborhoods that are polluted with uh, water and air pollution, this is the time to be stepping up and doing more to clean the environment, not stepping away from those environmental cleanups. And hey, if we can do polluter pay, we can take the burden off of the state and we can make polluters actually pay to clean up the messes that they make, which is what we should be doing to begin with. Um, it's, it's fiscally responsible to do and by the way, when um, this bottle bill stuff started happening and the, the suggestion that they would take money away from the pollution uh, prevent, cleanup fund and give it to the distributors, one of the groups that actually stood up against that was the Michigan Manufacturers Association. Why? Because they knew that taking money out of that fund would put a spotlight on the fact that those manufacturers are not paying to clean up the messes that they're making and they should be the ones that should be actually cleaning it up. They're afraid of the pressure. They're afraid of the, the, uh, you know, the, the public looking at them and saying, hey, the state's not cleaning this up anymore. You need to do it. And so you know, this is the time, if there's ever been a time, not only to step up and fight for that funding at the state level, but to step up and say, this is the time that we need polluters to actually be forced to clean up the messes that they make. Great, thank you, Representative. Would everybody else like to chime in on that? On how um, the uh, you know with COVID affecting the state budget, how that might affect um, funding for 201 or for other important Eagle programs uh, to make to old polluter to clean up the contamination that we have. Yeah, I, I, I'll just jump in quickly. I think the representative captured it very well. You know, we are going to be in 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 fiscally constrained times here. Um, and it could impact the funding coming in. Um, I mentioned the, the underground storage tank program is supported on a small fee and gasoline sales. Well, of course, gasoline sales are, are down because everyone's staying home appropriately. Um, so that funding will be you know, constricted a little bit. So you know, we're gonna have to be watching this very carefully as we move forward. I, I wanna quickly address um, the, the political viability of whether or not this is going to happen. Um, and, you know, I think that as our panelists have made really clear, um, you know, elected officials have to react to their constituencies, right? Like they are supposed to react to the pressure that they get from the people that they represent. And folks who are in charge of enforcing laws, um, they are uh, restricted by how good the laws are. Um, and so I think it's our job as advocates to build the political pressure that makes it impossible to keep um, standing in the way of passing this legislation. And that's a big lift, right? There's a lot of factors that go into that. But I, I think that um, you know, everyone who's here on this call is ready to start digging in and doing that work to make that, that political conversation change. Um, and until, until it does, and until we matter more than polluters in Lansing, um, then we're going to still um, keep spinning our wheels. Absolutely. Thank you um, for jumping in with that, Christy. Um, you know, I think that's uh, critical that we're providing the political will um, to make sure that legislate that you know legislators act on things that are as broadly popular as uh, the polluter pay bills that have been introduced uh, by Representative uh, Robbie and Senator Irwin. Um, so I did want to ask um, one other question. So earlier this year, and this was, you know, well, after around, around the holidays, this was a major issue at the time, which with the COVID pandemic, to, to me seems like years ago at this point, but um, we all remember the Green Ooze uh, site and the spill onto Highway 696 uh, from the chrome plating uh, business. Um, and so one of the things I know that kind of jumped out at the time was that, um, you know, Eagle had been in communication 
with uh, that site and monitoring that site for a long time. And one of the things that um, a lot of us, you know, have sort of wondered um, was it, do it doesn't seem like the Green News site um, was overlooked. So um, I was wondering, James, if you could just talk for a minute about uh, did that site just not rise to the level of other priorities because there were other priorities that were more contaminated and none of them just happened to spill out onto a giant highway and that's why 696 wound up getting attention? Um, in large part, that, that's true. You know, so, at, you know, a uh, few years back when basically the criminal prosecution was kind of brought uh, against the owner, the EPA had kind of gotten in and, and stabilized that site. So, you know, all the pits in the basement had been filled, it had been leveled, you know, so it looked like, again, we still knew it was a contaminated site, but it didn't look like a site that was, you know, actively putting the public at risk. Um, the, everyone there is on public water supply, so no one is drinking from the groundwater aquifer there. So even though we knew that there was probably some groundwater contamination, there was no kind of active kind of drinking of it in that location. Um, they had actually checked to see whether or not vapor intrusion was a problem in nearby buildings and kind of and it eliminated that as a potential exposure route. So, you know, it did not fall on the, you know, basically the, the highest level of concern that would have kept it kind of actively being monitored at that point. And it really was with that, with like the building, you know, becoming dilapidated groundwater and, and stormwater kind of running through the building, kind of filling pits back up. We're not sure exactly kind of what um, further um, activities the owner may have been possibly engaged in there. Um, so yeah, that's the, and to the point where it also become, of course, very visible again with, with the, with the green liquid there. So, um, and, you know, it's proceeding now, you know, actively kind of proceeding and, and kind of moving toward cleanup there. But you look at a city like Detroit that has tens of thousands of of abandoned buildings. Unfortunately, you know, there's a number of those that no one has been in for years um, and could be potential sites out there. So that really kind of shows the, one of the, you know, the aspects of polluter pay here where if the owner was more basically on the hook for everything that was going to happen there, you know, going, going forward, would owners be more active in making sure that those, you know, sites were being addressed in some way, shape or form. Great. Yeah, thank you uh, very much. And um, thanks, Senator Irwin. I see session has ended. Thank you uh, for joining us through all this. Um, yeah, sorry for the um, timing and scheduling problem. I also should probably apologize for the quick tour I just gave everybody through the Capitol. Uh, I thought that I would just stay there and do the, the rest of the town hall from session chambers, but uh, I think everybody who was there after nine hours or whatever, the staff kind of wanted to get out of there. So I didn't want to doom them to another however long to watching me you know on here so yeah thanks for having me i'm really sorry i was able to, I, I missed so much of it but i i know i heard from james cliff and yusuf rabi so i'm sure you're in very capable hands <laughs> yes thank you very much for joining us and um so uh getting into some of the questions we have in here we've had a few different categories of questions one that i know is very important to uh, both of your districts is uh, the Gelman site, uh, which I know has been a major motivator um, for both of you and all sorts of groups in Ann Arbor um, around polluter pay laws. And so um, I guess I'll just open it up with, um, would uh, Representative Robbie or Senator Irwin, would you like to give sort of an overview of the Gelman uh, situation and what's going on with that? I'll let Jeff do it. Yeah, I mean, I'll try to give you the really uh, quick version because, of course, this is a, a cleanup that's been going on for decades, and the pollution itself predated, uh, you know, the act of cleanup itself by decades. And so, you know, what essentially was happening was that a company named Gelman Sciences was building medical filters on Wagner Road, just west of Ann Arbor, and their process involved a chemical called 1,4-dioxane, the solvent, which they were using to burn holes in the in the filters, and um, you know, they were putting that uh, material out back in a in a in a pond that ultimately failed, uh, leaked into the, the, the groundwater. Uh, it's a little more complicated than that. There were other response activities. Uh, at one point, uh, the state had 
uh, authorized them to you know, inject wastes into a well. It's not entirely clear whether it was the pond or the well or some of the other uh, leaks that, that have led to uh, what we face now, which is a, a massive one four dioxane uh, plume underneath a huge part of the geography of, of Ann Arbor and Washtenaw County. And I think this is a particularly interesting site to look at uh, as it pertains to polluter pay and Part 201, which is, and that's because, you know, essentially what happened with the Gelman cleanup was that the company fought any sort of environmental uh, enforcement and regulation from the state, and it ended up going to a court case. And, and what the court ultimately determined is that our environmental laws are so weak in Michigan that because the people who lived above the plume in Ann Arbor were not actually drinking the water underneath them, that the company's cleanup plan could just be to let that pollution continue to spread. For the for the western part of the of the of the one four dioxane Gelman uh, you know disaster, the uh, state required them to actually contain the plume and to contain the pollution. But on the eastern side of the plume, once again, because people weren't coming into contact with that water on an active basis, they just said let it go. And that's exactly the problem that we're trying to fix with this polluter pay bill. And it's not just in Ann Arbor, it's happened all over the state where our lax standards combined with, um, you know, not just a lax standard around how clean is clean, but also uh, when you have to clean has led to a lot of poor cleanups. And then what happens is by the time it becomes green ooze, by the time it becomes a problem that people start getting cancer from or realizing, you know, at that point, yeah, it's migrated off site, but the people who are responsible are long gone. They're often bankrupt and it's, it's, it's nearly impossible to get to. And that's why our environmental laws have to be designed to get at these pollution problems early so that they can actually be cleaned up, require these polluters to actually deal with it uh, as soon as it's found so that it doesn't spread across a huge part of Washtenaw County and uh, now it's, you know, it's generating concerns about you know it starting to vent into basements as the the water table gets closer to the surface and if we just handled this in the first place by requiring the polluters to clean up their mess in the first place as much as they could then we wouldn't have this broom sp spreading all over uh, Ann Arbor and towards the river so that, that's my quick version I hope it was quick enough. Yeah, thank you very much. It was a good overview. And I know, um, you know, uh, in, so Gelman is probably an example of this. And there are definitely, as you said, other examples across the state. Um, uh, earlier, um, when you were um, speaking up for everybody in the Senate chambers, um, uh, Deputy A.G. Manning um, was talking about how when he started at the AG's office in 1994, it was um, a much easier job to hold polluters accountable due to the fact that we had a strong polluter pay law. Um, so with the bill that, um, that uh, you two introduced uh, this session, what changes would be made that might make it easier uh, to hold polluting entities accountable? Well, I just, took, I just talked a lot. I don't know if Yusuf wants to get in here, but uh, to me, uh, you know, the biggest thing is about, uh, you know, the, the, the triggers for action. Uh, we want action to happen sooner, and we want that action to be uh, um, more aggressive so that these um, sites that are polluted now don't, don't migrate and don't uh, cause human health problems later. And so really the crux of what we're proposing is to change the law from where it is now, where it says you can require the polluters to clean up their mess to the extent that you can show it's causing harm to instead say, no, the protection of our land, air, and water is a fundamental responsibility that we hold to the people who live in Michigan now and to all the future people who are gonna live in Michigan or come to Michigan. And what that means is that you have to clean up your mess as much as is practicable, not as much as will reduce human exposure, not as much as will uh, leave it in the ground, but keep it cordoned off from people. No, we want the pollution removed and we want it to be dealt with, um, you know, in the most um, um, safe way practicable. Now, I say practicable because I do want to allow that, uh, you know, the problem with some of these environmental disasters is that once the genie gets out of the bottle, nobody can put it back in, you know. And, um, you know, <laughs> that is gonna be a lingering problem. And, and, and so an additional benefit I think of doing a stronger polluter pay bill is that the way we set the law up now creates a bit of moral hazard for these folks who are the polluters. If they can just play the, you know, the, the regulators off for enough years to abscond beyond the corporate veil, uh, you know, um, all the money's gone and they never have to deal with it. 
you know, so what our bill really does is it advances, gives them more tools earlier, and also just gives them the ability to require them to clean up the mess, even if nobody's drinking it right now or no one's getting cancer from it right now. The thing that I'd add to that too is uh, part of, part of, and I said this early on, uh, but for those that joined after, you know, part of the beauty of this is that it actually puts a huge disincentive on polluters to actually, you know, pollute to begin with. Because if they know that they're going to have this huge financial burden, this huge financial liability, they may not want to, um, you know, uh, you know, inject whatever they're going to inject in the ground or, or, or and so forth. So there's also that side of it too. Um, but there were some questions, Sean, I don't know if this is a good time to move into it, but there were some questions I saw about, okay, these bills sound great. How do we get them passed? And yeah. I don't know if this is a good time to move into that, but. Absolutely. Let's go there. <laughs> okay. So, you know, I, just a general, th you know, thing, I think those are great questions because really that's, you know, I think we're all uh, pretty aware now of what, what the bills do, but now how do we move them across the finish line and just, you know, evaluating the, some of the political landscape that we have. I think, you know, we talked a little bit about green news. When Green News happened, um, it was like this huge, um, you know, rebirth, I guess, for polluter pay. And it started to reverberate beyond the traditional centers of, you know, environmental folks that are, you know, conscious about the, the, these issues. People, you know, are, are all around Michigan started to really, you know, care. They started to say, oh, my God, polluter pay, polluter pay. Maybe that's the solution, right? Um, and the governor even tweeted about it, uh, you know, and, and Jeff and I had introduced it like 12 months before. Um, and I had, you know, uh, even folks coming up to me that were like, you know, uh, you know, hey, how can I support your bill? How can I support this to move forward? Obviously, now things have transitioned and the, the public, um, you know, uh, uh, attention has shifted from uh, things like Green News to now uh, COVID-19. So I think if we're going to make this relevant, if we're going to make this issue of polluter pay, which transcends just this issue, but we also, we need to make it, in order to make it relevant, we need to make it relevant to this issue of COVID-19, because this is what people are facing right now. This is what people, um, you know, they, 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 this is what's real. Um, and so how do we uh, make sure that we're linking back polluter pay to combating COVID-19? And I think that really gets to what I was saying early on, which is pollution has a direct impact on people's ability to, um, to heal, and to uh, be able to combat viruses. It has a direct impact on whether or not people become more susceptible and die from things like COVID-19. Let's use another example of PFAS. Uh, there was a study that I saw, um, and, and, well, a Guardian article actually came out recently about, uh, about PFAS and the fact that actually people who are exposed to PFAS may have uh, you know, lower ability to fight off influenza and may actually have an impact on the effectiveness of vaccines, um, you know, against the flu and so forth. So there, there are very real public health impacts of environmental uh, harm of pollution. And again, we are seeing those environmental impacts hit communities of color particularly hard because those are the communities that are hit particularly hard with pollution. That's one of the many reasons. And they're under-resourced and they don't have the public health uh, you know, resources that they need. There's a lot of reasons there. There's a lot of, uh, you know, racial dispar disparities and, and reasons why COVID-19 is hitting places like Detroit so hard. But one of those reasons is, uh, you know, the, the envir environmental degradation that has happened, the fact that they don't have access to clean air and clean water in many cases uh, in many neighborhoods in Detroit. So this, this issue we need to be bringing forward right now. We need to make it relevant to COVID-19. We need to make it relevant to the, to the threats that people are currently under and i think that it is uh inc it, it, you know it, it, it as as i just mentioned we can do that we can make that argument and we can make it relevant today and we can say not only is it going to help now it's going to help for for hopefully for generations to come i totally agree with you representative robbie i think you're spot on um and i think the other side of that coin too is that um in the you know i mean the financial crisis is here and these giant corporate polluters um, can no longer get a free ride. They've had a, they've been externalizing their costs for decades and the bill is due and it's our health that's being, a, you know, we're paying that with our health. So um, I really appreciate that, that perspective. I think it's important. And then, you know, I can say this because, you know, I'm an advocate, but there's an election coming up um, 
and I think that our advocacy um, and engagement in that space too is going to shift the balance of power and change the conversation. Um, so we really need some very um, serious turnout and advocacy in the electoral space too in order to make those gains. That's where I was going to go with it and to add to that just that you know every single person who cares about polluter pay and who just cares more broadly about water quality and you know the health of uh, their family and future generations ask every single candidate who is running for office what they're going to do about it and then let them answer right go to their website find out what they're proposing on environmental issues what are they doing to advance the cause of clean water either in your town or your county or in the state legislature certainly every single candidate for state house should be asked by their citizens at coffee hours or public events or town halls or any sort of campaign events, house parties, whatever. What are you going to do about this? What are you going to do about PFAS? What are you going to do about polluters who don't clean up their mess? Uh, because I, um, you know, I don't think this is going to be surprising to anyone, but obviously, uh, you know, us political actors, uh, you know, when we're in the middle of a campaign, that's the, that's the time to start building that commitment towards future action. And I would add to that, one of the things that Yusuf said, or Representative Robbie said, that was, I think, uh, I want to expand on, is that um, he said that when the, the green ooze thing hit, and this also happened a bit with, the, with PFAS, is that, you know, there was a lot of folks who uh, started coming forward saying they were concerned about their water quality, or they were concerned about the state of our environmental laws and uh, enforcement here in Michigan, who weren't the, the usual suspects. And it's just so important to continue to organize and bring new people into the movement. And I would uh, also say that it's particularly important to try to find ways to get new angles to, to press this point, right? So one of the things Representative Robbie said a moment ago, it, it meant much more eloquently than I did, is that by having better pollution control laws, we get better corporate citizens. The flip side of that is that there's a bunch of businesses out there that don't benefit from allowing fossil fuel burners to externalize their costs into our lungs and into our bodies. There's a lot of businesses out there that want to do the right thing. There's a lot of businesses out there that are taking action on climate change or, or do, have a great recycling program or whatever it is. Like they're, they're concerned too. And we need to bring those folks in and make it very, very obvious to them and make it part of our message that it's about making sure that, that, that it's, not, it's not an anti-business message. It's a pro-business message, but it's not that simple. We want great businesses. We want great economic development. We want the jobs of the future. We don't necessarily want someone who's going to come here and use our state as a garbage can. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I do think we need to drive a wedge between this, you know, corporate world that is often considered a monolith by many people like me uh, who are very political and, 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 and see it that way for good reasons. But the, but the truth is there's a lot of folks out there in that world who, who, who have common cause with us and who we can get on our side. And at the risk of going on too long, there's also a, a, a large river of opportunity in the faith community. There's a number of folks there who, who um, you know, may not be the kind of person who would be excited to show up and vote for Jeff Irwin because I'm too liberal for them, but who would still care about the environment. They care that the world is going to be here for their grandchildren. And the reason, uh, part of what they, how they care and part of the window to that philosophy is through their faith. And so for folks who can... Uh, do that kind of organizing for folks who can speak out within their faith communities and try to uh, get official action from their churches. That can make a big, big difference. You know, uh, if we had uh, another issue that Representative Robbie and I have worked on together over the years is clean energy. And um, some of the churches have been really powerful allies because they've got big buildings and they'd love to be able to do higher tech, lower cost, cleaner energy uh, projects. So we need to find those unconventional allies. We need to water those gardens, build those relationships, and uh, you know, make sure that we use them for um, you know, changing the faces in the chamber, but also finding ways to get to the hearts and minds of the folks that are there now that don't necessarily agree. One of the, one of the things I'd love to add, Sean, and if I have just uh, two minutes, I think uh, Senator Irwin did a great job of outlining that. One, one thing that I want to emphasize on, on what you know, we're talking about here is a dynamic, I think, that all of the viewers should know. Um, and this kind of gets to what Christy was saying, too. Um, the Michigan Manufacturers Association is the greatest enemy of polluter pet right now. Um, the Michigan Manufacturers Association also happens to be one of the major funders of the Republican caucus in the House and the Senate. 
So some of the questions that I was seeing out there were saying, why, how do we get this a timely hearing? Um, and the reality, um, unfortunate reality that we're facing is it's not getting a timely hearing. And part of that is because specifically of the Michigan Manufacturers Association and the fact that they have their clause uh, in the Republican caucus and the Republican legislators. And they're basically saying, if you give this a hearing, um, you're dead to us. And the Republican caucus won't do it. Um, and, and so how do, we, how, do we, how do we change that? The, way, the, the, the most easy way to change that within the next six months is the election. Because uh, the Michigan Manufacturers Association, um, you know, we, we have Democratic uh, candidates across the state that are running against Man Michigan Manufacturers Association backed, uh, you know, uh, Republicans that are looking to unseat them, that are looking to flip seats, that are looking to take the majority back. And the dynamic, the reality, and I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about this, Sean, but I'm, I'm yeah. doing it. <laughs> uh, the, but uh, part of the reality is, is that whoever controls the gavel, and, and Jeff knows this too, whoever controls the gavel controls the conversation. They control the committees. They control which bills come up. They control which bills come to the floor. It's all about the gavel. And because the gavel is controlled by a speaker and a majority leader in the Senate, that have that are that are controlled by the Michigan Manufacturers Association. The the solution is to get them out of there and put the gavel in the hands of people that are actually, um, you know, going to even put this up for a freaking hearing. Uh, I mean, even if we could just get a hearing on these bills, um, that that would help change. And so your role in that is we need your help to, you know, flip some of these seats. To, to, and I'm not saying like all Democrats are like, you know, uh, uh, the greatest on this issue, but I'm saying there are, there are candidates right now out there who are running to, uh, to keep their seats or who are running to flip Democrat, uh, Republican seats to Democratic that will help to change this conversation in Lansing. Elections matter. They have consequences. We're seeing that every day with this pandemic, and it matters for this legislation that we're talking about today. It can make all the difference. And uh, so get out there. And one of the comments that I saw in there that I want to buttress too is the comment that says, talk to your friends and family. And I say this anytime I have any opportunity I have, because uh, you know, if you, if you already live in the 53rd district or if you already live in, in my district, or if you already live in, in Senator Irwin's district, you know, we're out there fighting for this polluter pay thing. Um, but maybe you have friends that live in Livingston County. Maybe you have friends that live in Northern Michigan in these Republican districts. And you can call these legislators and you can hammer them. And you can uh, encourage your friends and family to support candidates that are going to support polluter pay. This is how uh, we make a difference. This is how we move the needle. Um, it's, it's by your activism. It's by you working to support organizations like Clean Water and Sierra Club that are doing this work on the ground and then going to your friends, to your family members and asking them to support too, because they need to understand how much this means, not just for people uh, you know, in Southeast Michigan, not just for people in West Michigan, but for people all over this state, there are so many polluted areas across Michigan from, uh, from every corner of this state, and we need to clean it up now. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you guys for, you know, I think some people really hit the nail on the head there. And so a couple of the questions that came in um, while we were talking there, uh, Senator Irwin's point on driving a wedge between the companies that externalize their costs and the ones who want to be responsible members of the community is interesting. How do we identify the latter? Um, and so I, I guess one of the things I would start with, there's a really great organization that sort of, so um, for those who may not be as aware, as aware of this as well, the Chamber of Commerce is definitely not in favor of uh, polluter pay laws. And they're one of the strongest lobby groups in Lansing. Um, there is, however, another group of businesses, which basically represent a lot of small Michigan businesses called the Great Lakes Business Network. Um, and it, you, there's a lot of really great local businesses that we can support in the business network. Uh, places like Bell's Brewery, Cherry Republic, um, Zingerman's, I believe is a member in Ann Arbor. Um, a lot of our really great businesses who do want to be members of the community, um, good you know, members of the community can be found there. Um, it's not just the corporate manufacturers uh, who control business in Michigan. Um, and then I saw another couple questions coming in about individual lawmakers. And if you want to see um, the full list of who sponsored or who uh, sponsored and co-sponsored polluter pay and some of our other um, key pieces of legislation from this year, uh, Sierra Club and Clean Water Action actually put out a joint uh, scorecard earlier this year where we took a look at um, 
our state house and state senate um, members and who sponsored and co-sponsored different pieces of environmental legislation. So you can find the full list on either of our websites, cleanwateraction.org slash MI. Oh, and uh, thank you, SC Jen, just put the link to the scorecard uh, in the chat box here. Um, so that can be found there and you can see all of who has uh, officially co-sponsored the polluter pay uh, legislation. It's important that we can get more folks in office who support this so that we can move forward on polluter pay. Um, and then- uh, Sorry, let me jump in just to give you a little bit of um, additional backup on that question of like, who are some of these business groups? Is, is now a good time? Yeah, please. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned the brewers and I think that's kind of a window into uh, you know how this can be done best, which is that there are just industries out there that it makes a lot of sense for. Brewers depend on clean water. They don't get really any benefit from uh, burning fossil fuels. And so, you know, it makes a lot of sense for them. Uh, I'm reminded of the fight around line five and all the you know tourist related industries up north that have come out and said, you know what, uh, we're taking a big risk for no benefit and the risk is total to my hotel or my ferry operation or you know what have you. So you know Michigan, uh, our, our number two industry is tourism and hospitality, and uh, there's, there's not a lot of benefit that the tourism and hospitality industry gets from from additional polluting. Uh, I would talk about a lot of outdoor recreation. You know, can we get these companies that we support to speak out on our behalf? If, you know, I, I say we, because I'm the kind of person who likes to go out and, you know, kayak or mountain bike or hike and backpack and that kind of thing. Uh, you know, uh, those folks, you know, they're doing big business. They need to step up to support us. You know, there's, there, there's all sorts of restaurants. And I think about every single local chamber of commerce all over the state. They're not very well represented by the Michigan Chamber of Commerce. But when yeah. the Michigan Chamber of Commerce walks into the legislature and they put a card in the committee that says that the Michigan Chamber of Commerce opposes or supports this bill, it makes it seem like the business community broadly is in favor of that. Well, usually it's really just the big business communities, the people who are kind of the biggest heavyweights around the chamber table. There's all these businesses, thousands and thousands of them that really are um, you know, together much larger and much more important that never really weigh in at that level. So if we can get them to weigh in in their local chamber, uh, that can be really powerful. So for instance, um, you know, the Ann Arbor Chamber has often come out in favor of a lot of environmental issues. And, uh, you know, it would be even more powerful if we could get, uh, you know, the local chambers in the districts of some of the Republicans to say, it really doesn't benefit us to have more expensive, dirty energy that we have to buy from far away to burn to destroy the planet. It just doesn't make any sense. Let's instead do these smart ideas to, you know, pollute less and save money. I mean, these are the kinds of things we can get to people in the business community on, especially now that some of the economics around fossil fuels have become so terrible, even with offloading their externalities. Uh, so those are, you know, I just think there's a lot of local opportunities to get business groups to support it. And if we can affect SBAM or some of those other groups, that'd be great too. Absolutely. Thank you. And then there's another question here. Um, I think it would be a great question for, James, uh, Ron was asking what resources are available to see the sites that need to be cleaned up in a given county for the public to find? Um, so again, we've got, you know, district offices around the state. You know, we don't have them by county, um, just different regions of the state. Um, and they really are kind of looking around their region to see, okay, which sites, you know, pose the greatest risk and, and therefore those are the ones that get more of the staff resources dedicated toward them. Um, so, you know, again, getting to know the, those district staff um, and they're taking input from their elected officials. So county officials, city officials, you know, if they bring sites to their attention, you know, they're ones that will obviously be reviewed. So they're, they're taking input kind of from, from every place they can get it. And a lot of times it's even just, you know, regular citizens have brought, you know, many sites to our attention where, you know, it might just start out to be, hey, my, my drinking water has changed, either a smell or a taste change, you know, that testing of drinking water, you know, leads to the discovery of a contaminated site or something. So again, all I could say is kind of have those officials kind of contact, you know, the district kind of staff or EGLE um, and they're the ones that basically then, I mean, the decision still on kind of allocation of resources will happen kind of centrally um, based on the needs of all the districts, but those are the best contacts you can make. 
I just want to offer to um, if there's a particular geographic area or you need help navigating Eagle resources, they can be um, a little bureaucratically um, dense in a front facing sort of way. We're happy to help at Sierra Club. Um, we help members all the time try and figure out how and where to get information. Um, it's not always easy at first glance. And I'm sure that Clean Water would do the same thing. Oh, absolutely. Thank you very much, uh, James and Christy. Um, and so another question we had here, and I know for um, Clean Water Action, especially this was an important um, component of uh, the polluter pay bill from uh, Senator Irwin, Representative Robbie, um, is that it would require uh, corporate entities to clean up water pollution regardless of whether or not that body of water is currently in use as a drinking water source. Um, we have a question here from Ashlyn uh, about how does the polluter pay bill address public health effects due to environmental contamination such as drinking water contamination? Um, do you, anybody want to take a shot at that? I'm waiting to see if Peter is going to step forward. <laughs> yeah, ahead. you're probably, I was going to say you're probably a better person to answer. I mean, the the cleanup standards are, even as they, as they exist today, are based on are, on health impacts, right? And the prior standards as well, um, when you had to clean up to criteria, were also based on um, health impacts. Um, I think one of the issues that, that Eagle is looking at, and I know my boss was involved in, or some of the amendments to uh, Part 201 uh, at the tail end of the prior administration that um, may make it a little more difficult to adjust standards to address new contaminants um, as PFAS was. So I think that's that that's an important part of the equation to remember as well. Is um, you know how do you what are the standards you create? Um, are they scientifically based and are also though, can Eagle move quickly enough when you have something like PFAS that, that really emerged and people didn't know what the standards were. I think people still don't know um, what the standard is, but um, you know, the, the state should be able to respond quickly to a, to a threat like that. Yeah, let me just, uh, I'll fill in a little bit more there. You know, currently the cleanup standards, you know, are looking at basically all the different ways that contamination, you know, hazardous substances might impact the public. So, you know, you're looking at a soil concentration uh, because people who are living near area, that soil might kind of blow onto them, you know, especially like a residential standard. You know, we're looking at, well, geez, what if a kid is playing in the dirt, you know, how much dirt might they ingest, you know, over a lifetime? And they're looking at that looking at discharge of water into surface water, you know, how might that get into fish that people might eat, you know, and that's taken into consideration setting that standard. Um, again, of course, groundwater, looking at if people are drinking it, especially, you know, looking at that drinking water standard. And if it's discharging into a surface water, again, applying that surface water standard. I think the PFAS is a good example where Eagle has, you know, promulgated new standards for PFAS or at least seven of the PFAS chemicals. Um, that rule is now over at the legislature in what they call the Joint Committee of Administrative Rules, where they have kind of one last look at it to, to see if they think it complies with the statute. Um, if those rules, you know, are kind of get through the JCAR process, and right now it's, uh, they have a certain number of session days to get to it. So um, the, that clock is ticking at this point, but, uh, if those are then adopted and go into effect, those standards will then be folded into the Part 201 program and those will become the, the standards for Part 201. So again, all of the different kind of routes of public health are kind of looked at. Um, but as Peter mentioned, you know, kind of updating those standards going forward, uh, they've made the, uh, the, the burden a little higher on the department to kind of justify changes going forward in legislation that was passed in 2018. Yeah, thank you very much. And um, so uh, we're going to move into um, closing comments here. Thank you, everybody, for joining. I think we've learned um, you know, a lot tonight about how the contamination, uh, contaminated site cleanup program currently operates, uh, what the polluter pay bills would change, and also how to get the political action that we need to make sure that we can pass polluter pay and better laws like this. And um, you know, I'd just also like to flag, we didn't quite get to talking about them tonight, but I know 
um, several of um, Representative Robbie's colleagues uh, in the House Democratic Caucus have introduced a series of bills um, to uh, hoard, hold corporate polluters accountable, things like extending the statute of limitations um, on environmental uh, on environmental contamination uh, from the current six years to a more reasonable period of never. Um, and uh, also um, a bill to adapt what they call cor responsible corporate officer doctrine in California so that corporate officers can be held civilly and criminally liable um, and uh, as well as increasing fines that corporations would have to pay to a percentage of revenue um, instead of something they just work into their budgets. Um, so it's been really great to see the legislative action uh, on that. And, um, you know, it's be, we're, we are with uh, Clean Water Action, you know, we are dedicated towards moving polluter pay forward, whether that's this session um, or even if we have to wait until next session to make sure that we can pass this law and get uh, our state back on track with funding for cleanups. Um, so yeah, let's go around for closing comments uh, for folks. Um, and uh, would uh, who who would like to start? <laughs> They're all so shy, especially you know our senator <laughs> and representative. We know that, but I'll just really quickly I appreciate the opportunity to, to to join this evening. You know, answer a few questions, um, and definitely look uh, forward to continuing to work with Senator Irwin and Representative Robbie on their their uh, legislation as it moves forward. I'll be quick too. Um, there's so much gratitude for our leaders in Lansing, um, but also everyone on the call who is working hard to make sure that we um, elect good leaders. And I just want to remind everyone, um, especially in this current political climate, um, all of our conversations right now are really uh, conversations about power. Um, and we need to change the power dynamics in Lansing in order to put people over the profits of polluters. You want me to go quickly so we can let the, the elected representatives. I, I just want to mention time, take the time. <laughs> um, that the I think this is a great first step. The other thing I was going to mention, I think James will probably um, agree with this, is that the, the funding piece is important. So I think since I've been working with the state for 26 years and, and was doing uh, cleanup enforcement. I think we had at least two um, bond initiatives to fund the, the cleanup program. Um, polluters should pay, but one of the things of, of, about having available funding is you can get the state out to do the cleanup. And then again, when I was hired in 1994, it was a cost recovery initiative. So what we were doing was going out and suing companies um, to recover the costs the state had um, incurred. And then, as James mentioned, um, you know, one of the one of the things that can be frustrating about is enforcement is you have a clearly liable party, you've got them dead to rights, you get them to court, they don't have the resources to to actually fund um, the cleanup. And so, you know, there is again, I understand it's a heavy lift, especially these days with the way the fiscal situation is. But I do think funding is also an important um, piece so that the state can can do work itself and maybe enforce but also just be able to, to take care of some of this, these lagging um, orphan sites that we've had around for years. Yeah, those are good points. And uh, one of the things that you know, I've been trying to talk to folks across the aisle on is, uh, you know, how could maybe redo another environmental bond? It may not be the most um, you know, financially wise way to, to structure your <laughs> uh, annual costs, but uh, given the cost of money now and uh, given the chance that cleaning up orphan sites is really something that we can come together on in a bipartisan fashion uh, because it helps a lot of their friends, you know, and this is something that we really need to be pushing towards um, this fall or, or, or maybe, um, you know, a subsequent election because uh, the state is going to be in a difficult financial position and that's going to make it harder to fund these important environmental programs. Um, you know, beyond that, I do want to also take the opportunity to thank everyone who's been on here, apologize for being late. Um, you know, I really appreciate the work that so many of you are doing because those of us who, who, you know, who are elected officials working on your behalf are really standing on your shoulders. And so I want to thank you for all the activism, all the um, you know, work that you're doing to, to, to push us in the right direction to make Michigan's future you know, a cleaner, better place for 
for the people we don't even know who are going to come here later, uh, either after us or, or, or behind us, so to speak. So, um, you know, this is a passion of mine. It's something I've always uh, been a motivating factor for me to get involved in, in politics. And as it was said a moment ago that really resonated with me, what we're talking about here really is, is power. And, and how do we get the power to change the result in Lansing so that the polluters don't continue to have you know, the ability to, to shirk their responsibility? We need, to, we need to organize, we need to speak to people, we need to get our friends, our family, our coworkers, and we need to be um, you know, clear about, about what it is that really brings us together because this is an issue we should be able to win uh, with, with some folks from the other side of the aisle on our side, but we need your help to do it. And so I appreciate everybody's interest. I appreciate the folks that are working hard at the Attorney General's office and uh, over at Eagle. And um, you know, I look forward to working uh, for and with all of you in the future to try to uh, you know, change the faces in Lansing and change the result that we're getting uh, for our uh, air and water and land. Thanks, Jeff. Um, and you know, I, I, I don't have too much to add. I think Jeff did a pretty good job of closing there. Um, you know, I, I think the, the one thing that I did want to try to uh, talk about too during this, and it, it's kind of been a theme for me, is I do think we need to, you know, eat. so polluter pay is important for so many different reasons. Uh, and there's a lot of other things too that we need to be working on. Uh, and House Dems have, uh, you know, recently released a pretty uh, comprehensive, um, you know, platform of items that we think we need to be working on, especially right now during this pandemic. And some of the things that we're calling for is actually um, an end to new, any new pollution, any new permits that would be issued that allow any type of pollution in the state, we think that should just stop. Um, we don't think that that's acceptable, particularly right now uh, during this pandemic. The other thing though that we, that we wanna talk about is, you know, a lot of our conversation today is focused around protecting um, water from getting contaminated to begin with. But the other side of that too, is making sure that everybody in our state has access to clean water. Uh, we have um, residents in uh, places like Detroit and all across Southeast Michigan, uh, Flint, other parts of the state that, you know, that, that have their water shut off uh, because they can't pay um, to have, you know, for their utility bill. Water is a human right. Water is essential. We all deserve to have, you know, a glass of water to drink. Um, we all deserve to take a shower, especially right now during a pandemic, we'd be washing our hands. Um, and the fact that for so long, you know, people's taps were shut off you know, be, uh, their, their water was shut off. Fortunately, there was an executive order to open some of that up. We think that that needs to just be continued. Uh, we need to continue allowing for people to access clean, safe water. And the other side of that uh, as well, with that access to clean water is stopping the, the, the theft of the clean water that we do have in the state of Michigan from companies like Nestle um, and other corporations that are coming into our state. Um, and as as other companies are polluting those little uh, areas all over Mich Michigan that we talked about, we have these contaminated sites popping up all over the place. And th on the converse side, the sites that aren't contaminated, they're starting to steal the water away from us, right? So we're, we're fighting this on two fronts. Um, and we need to, yes, focus on polluter pay. That's one of the most important things to do. But we also need to focus on, uh, you know, passing legislation like the bills that I introduced with Representative uh, Hood and Representative Kohutsky. Um, to really uh, stand up to those corporations that are trying to come into Michigan and take away our groundwater um, and sell it at a profit, um, you know, and then on the and then again, you know, fighting for the the social justice and equity aspect to make sure that every single Michigander has access to clean and safe drinking water. Water is a human right. That's what we're fighting for here. That's what all the actions that we talked about today amount to. Whether you're um, helping out or whether you're gonna help out in a political campaign, whether you're gonna call your friends, whether you're gonna call your family members, whatever you, or whether you're gonna help support Clean Water Action or Sierra Club, uh, whatever action you decide to take, that is all going towards the effort of ensuring that water is accessible to all because water is a human right. That's the bottom line. Um, and before, before I end, I do wanna give a shout out. Uh, Peter, thank you for representing your boss so well. We have one of the, we have the most fantastic attorney general in the entire country here in the state of Michigan. Shout out to Dana Nessel. She's amazing. She's fighting the good fight. Um, I love her. She's fantastic. Um, and she has all the support uh, from me. Uh, you know, she's doing a fantastic job. So we need to support her too in the work that she's doing. Um, thank you all for tuning in. This has been a fantastic opportunity. Um, and I hope you stay involved and stay engaged. 
this crisis right now is it is it is dark it is difficult we are struggling through it many people are are suffering whether it's physically or economically um the the pressure is there our communities are feeling it but this is also the time that you know in in all of our homes uh while we're safe so, social distancing and and sheltering in place this is the time to dream of a better world this is the time to organize for a better world this is the time to call your family members, to check in with them, to have those conversations. This is the time to fight for uh, a better world. And when we come out of this, we can, we can build a better future for all. And as Jeff said, fight for that future that for people that we may never meet. That's what this is all about. Um, stay safe. And thank you, Sean, and all the organizers, uh, Clean Water Action, Sierra Club, for helping to put this together. And thank you all very much. I want to, a big thank you to um, our panelists, uh, Deputy A.G. Manning, Deputy Director Clift, our um, you know, heroes in state government doing underfunded and critically important work. Um, so thanks for taking time to join us tonight. And our uh, you know, elected leaders here, Senator Irwin and Representative Robbie, these guys have been constant champions on environmental issues, constantly um, you know, among the top lawmakers on any scorecard or anything that Clean Water Action has ever put out. Um, and Christy with Sierra Club, thank you so much. Um, you know, we wouldn't be anywhere without allies, and we definitely wouldn't be anywhere without um, the hardworking members and volunteers uh, like those of you um, who joined us tonight. Thank you so much, and I hope you can join us for uh, the next in our uh, My Water, My Future uh, Town Hall series, which will be Thursday evening, May 14th, on No Stricter Than Federal and How Strict Is Federal. Um, so thank you all, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Have a good evening. Bye, everybody.